Um, I think it's a pretty kind of dumb, unfair argument to just say that Solana is not decentralized. I think you're not really like looking under the hood and understanding like that the cost of the hardware is the cheapest possible cost that you can have to achieve what we're doing. You may not like want uh, a global price, synchronized price discovery engine. Like that may be not something that you care about. And that's great. Go use Ethereum. Like you can get settlement guarantees there, but a lot of people want that. And that's actually very important for finance. Like you look at the, the traditional trade fi stack, all of the money is not made in settlement. It's made in execution. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Empire. We got Santi co-hosting with me, and then we we're uh, very lucky to be joined by Ben Sparango, uh, head of BD at Solana, as well as Anatoly. Back for a uh, second time, Anatoly was on the show last year. Um, and uh, yeah, Anatoly, Ben, welcome to Empire, guys. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for having us. Here. Yeah, of course. Um, all right, guys. So I think uh, there's obviously a lot that we need to talk about here and that we want to talk about. I think the most pressing thing and the best place to start here would obviously be talking about FTX and, and SPF. Um, you guys... Uh, had like an intertwined relationship that I would love to just figure out like what it was almost. And I think the best place to kick this off would be Anatoly. Uh, if you, can you just kind of share with the listeners, like what was your relationship with Sam and maybe starting with like, how did it start? Who introduced you? Like what was, how did this whole, how did Solana get so intertwined with FTX? Yeah. So labs was founded in like 2018 at the start of that bear market, basically, right. As the, you know, the everything was burning in crypto and crypto was dying. We raised a bit of a seed round and started labs and our seed deck literally said blockchain at NASDAQ speed. I thought the most important thing that blockchains do is the they synchronize like prices around the world in a censorship resistant way. And that was like what we built for. We had like uh DAX as our stress test, uh and like our kind of like number one thing that we really wanted to see on the network. And we wanted to build a central limit order book. That was really like the thesis that like, that's the most efficient way to do price discovery. And we're going to build a blockchain that does that really, really well. So when I got connected to Sam in like 2020, I think it was either through, I believe it was mostly through Kyle, but there's also a couple other investors like Edith Young and Chris McCann that were like also connected to Sam. And I think all of us wanted to get us in the same room. And I pitched him this idea, like, you know, you look at Solana and like how it's designed, imagine we optimize this thing to its natural conclusion. We'll have information propagating through this network as fast as the speed of light through fiber. So like news before the event happens in Singapore, that that like those bits have to get to Bloomberg terminal in New York. They have to go speed of light through fiber, right? At that same time, state transition propagates through Solana, speed of light through fiber. By the time the trader sees that news flash, the price on the CME or NASDAQ is the same as the price in a market running on Solana. So we're as good at price discovery as the fastest exchanges. And that was like kind of the, the pitch and the selling point. And this was at the time when Uniswaps just started to like early, early show early signs of product market fit and it's like, early first day of DeFi summer, basically. And Sam was like, okay, I want to do something in DeFi and I don't want to like build a side chain with, with like our own stupid decks running on it. I want it to be like more real. And he saw that we had technology that enabled them to do that. And we had this demo called break. You smash your keyboard and every transaction, you can go play right now. Um, Every transaction sends off and it gets confirmed that it lights up green. It's a very like visceral experience. You could, I suggest people try it. And like you actually see that this is like a Web2 experience. You don't you even forget that you're using like a crypto thing. It's like not even, it was really kind of shocking to people that that could work. So we gave them this demo. We saw like within a few hours, they were spamming the network. And then like the next day, it was like, okay, we're going to go build Serum. And they, had eight engineers at the time total at FTX. They put four of them in Serum. So it was like a pretty big commitment from their side. And at that time, like 2020 FTX was like up and coming exchange. It was, I think, maybe just barely cracked the top 10. And people knew Sam from like his like stuff on Twitter. And within four weeks, they went from nothing. And at that time, Solana literally had nothing. We had 
barely an explorer that kind of sort of worked. <laughs> no wallet. It was a command line wallet, right? And like trust wallet was the only other thing. There's no DAP wallet. So they built the wallet. They built a bunch of introspection tools. They built Serum, all the UIs for it. Got, you know, market makers and everyone else involved and launched it. And like, that was a pretty big lift. And I was probably naive, but like, at least I convinced myself that like, you know, they're building this technology because they want to disrupt themselves and they see that DeFi will eventually take over. And like, eventually Serum is going to be what FTX runs on. Like that was at least like the, what I thought was actually going to happen. Um, and like, our relationship between like us and Sam was like, you know, if we had product ideas that we could synchronize on, I could reach him, right? Like he'd be one of the people that I talked to. I talked to a bunch of people, but he would be one of the first people I talked to. Like, hey, we're, you know, we want to build a phone or do this other thing. Can you guys like port your application to it or like give us an API for like a fiat ramp or whatever? It wasn't, that was basically like this kind of, that I felt like, I could depend on them to build stuff that we couldn't because they had a, an exchange that had like fiat ramps and all this other stuff that was very centralized and could really let us like get to market with like cool products much, much faster. Yeah. Wh uh, where did you meet them? Did you guys do drinks? You got, you do like a dinner and it was a zoom call. This was COVID days. It was so COVID, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was, it was a bunch of phone calls. Like uh, mm -hmm. I didn't meet them until I think, a year later at Bitcoin Miami. Hmm. I remember interviewing him in like May of 2021. And my thought was, I remember halfway through the interview, a two hour interview, halfway through it, he got, he's like, oh, by the way, yeah, I'm in, I'm in, I think he's in Hong Kong at the time or something like that. He's like, yeah, it's 3 a.m. my time. I was like, oh my God, like you stayed, like I should be the one staying up till 3 a.m. to interview you, like not the other, I was, I was really blown away. And like, I think I maybe like along with a lot of other people probably got played. I'm, I'm curious. What was your interaction when, when you met him? Like, were you, did you think like, wow, giga brain, like genius entrepreneur here? Were you more skeptical? Like, I'm just curious. He fit his persona well. Like I thought yeah. he kind of had this like character of I'm an MIT giga brain. And like, he dressed like, he, he, he's just like, I think, yeah. uh, dressed like it, right? Like basically just fit that persona. Um, and like, I think... Given that his success in like both Alameda and the exchange, you kind of just felt like maybe it's true, right? Like maybe he's that smart and like, I don't know, studied physics at MIT. That, that seems pretty impressive. The, the, there's this sort of idea that was surfacing on around certain circles that, you know, Alameda or FTX was sort of a, it became like they were doing some pretty harmful stuff in terms of like listing perps early on and, you know, Alameda investing in some projects and then FTX providing exit liquidity. Like these were things that, you know, at the time, like around the Bitcoin conference, it, it, it was already surfacing. Um, perhaps this like conflict of interest. I'm curious, like if there was a time that you felt that their contribution to the Solana ecosystem was actually subtractive where it became negative and they weren't really as a positive force as they seem to make it. Yeah, there was like a, there was a, a long period where there was a lot of engineering output out of them, like both on Serum and supporting like projects that were launching and like figuring out like all the APIs and like getting Armani and like Armani was like a, you know, a gift to the whole Solana ecosystem, just him, him working on, on anchor and stuff like that. Um, and I think at some point it flipped to where FTX was growing really rapidly and they were working on their brand and expansion and all these other things. And that the engineering effort like went somewhere else, like, and that's, that was like one change in terms of like the FTV tokens, like we had a very different point of view on that. Like I always felt that like you got to like force price discovery as early as possible because that's when you build your community, the people that join or the hardcore people it, in that tumultuous time where price discovery occurs and they're, you got to give them like a, a 
a chunk, right? You got to be open with them. And that was something that I think they just didn't do um, with like all the coins that they launched. But those were like, I think, very SAM driven projects. There was just a lot of other shit happening that wasn't SAM related. Like all of the DeFi projects that launched in the DeFi hackathon, I think, I don't even think like Mango like was anti taking Alameda's money. Like, there were like, there was already like a faction of like DeFi builders on Solana that were like, we like Solana and like, we heard of it because of Sam, but we don't want to, de- we don't want like to deal with them. So that was already kind of happening. Yeah. So, Santi, just to, to elaborate a little bit more, I think. Which there wasn't quiet. a point where it would, there wasn't a point where it was like apparent to us where you know it flipped negative their impact um, over time. I think our relationship just kind of dwindled. Honestly, right around Bitcoin Miami was when like it's like we stopped like uh, talking to them as much or them having as much engineering output as as Anatoly had mentioned. And then you know like six months later, we find out that FTX Ventures is investing in direct competitors to Solana in Aptos and in Mistin. And so like very rapidly, they switched to like bigger and better things and doing more things. And you know that you know we were just focused on the ecosystem and the projects that we were building internally. Yeah, um, I'm curious. There's this idea that I was hearing perhaps over the last year, which is what would have been of Solana without Sam, without FTX, without Alameda? What would you, like, obviously it's impossible in a parallel universe, yes. but I guess what I'm trying to get at is how influential was he in Ben from your perspective on the BD side of things? You talked to corporations, <laughs> SPF was the the golden boy on, you know, on, on TV and kind of the face of crypto. Anatoly, I'm just kind of curious um, how you would, how would you characterize that statement? I mean, the tech is awesome and what I think stands on its own. We're still not at a place where all the competitors combined generate as many transactions per day as Solana. <laughs> like, and it's been two and a half years. So I think we could have gotten there. Um, but I don't know, like, it, it's really hard to predict, right? Like, it really in those early days it felt really sincere and like i don't know if i was naive but i thought shit like this idea of like decentralized finance could actually happen with ftx and he's so forward thinking that he's disrupting himself and that felt like just such awesome alignment but yeah that it's hard to hard to know what would have happened um without i I think we would have like made it long term would it have happened as rapidly as it did i don't know because serum became that immediate source of liquidity like right as the bull market was hitting and it was kind of perfect timing whereas you know we were struggling to find builders in those early days like when i joined the team in summer of of 2020 uh it was just serum and orca those were that was it in terms of ecosystem projects and then once we had you know the notoriety from sam and from serum that kind of like broke down the dam a little bit for other people to be like you know maybe i'll explore the development environment here i'll participate in a hackathon and then you know we kind of snowballed all of that into like an, a, a living breathing ecosystem do you think that given everything that's going on in Sam's rapid fall, you stand on your own ground. Uh, you know, you look at TVL, Solana's down now to number 10, you know, apps like Phantom, Optimism, Avalanche have higher TVL. Arguably, TVL is not the right metric. But what I'm trying to say is that there was a time where Solana, you know, was much higher up and, and people look at TVL, they will always look at TVL. But I think it's, it's one of those, the heart of the question is how... Where, where are you guys now in terms of the viability of DeFi and Solana? I think a lot of builders are now asking the question, what's going to happen with Solana? You know, is this a chain that I should build on? Should I go elsewhere? Aptos, you name it, the next chain. Before I address the the immediate question, I just want to make aware that like the Solana ecosystem has a lot of sub subsectors that we refer to them as DeFi, NFTs, games, uh, payments, DAOs, um, all of which are are thriving in their own right. DeFi has been the most hit hard just because general macro environment, anti-crypto, and then the additional punch in the face of FTX and Alameda blowing up most recently. So DeFi is in a tough spot right now. 
But the the thing that is most important that I see is like the resolve of the builders in the DeFi ecosystem. If we were worried about the DeFi ecosystem disappearing, um, we would be seeing a mass exodus of these builders. And that's just frankly what we're not doing. Uh, the, the, the first thing that I did after FTX came down was touch base with a lot of the DeFi teams and say, uh, how much exposure do you guys have? You know, what, what, if, if you had exposure, what do you guys need to plug the hole? Who can I help introduce you to trying to make sure that everybody's okay. And frankly, we've seen like an incredible resolve from all the people that are building in DeFi. So I'm not worried about DeFi long term. Ultimately, there are headwinds right now that are that are hampering liquidity. Uh, But over time, that will be ameliorated. And I'm sure the DeFi ecosystem will do things and iterate to bring more liquidity, more users, more use cases, because ultimately, the reason why a lot of these people came to Solana is because Solana offers something that these other blockchains don't. And it's different infrastructure that can support better trading financial products than some of these other blockchains. And I think that that still stands regardless of what happened. Ben, you were, um, you were multi-coin from what, 2019 through like near the end of 2020 and then, and then joined Solana. It's just, um, did, did it feel like this match made in heaven when like, when, when, when FTX connected with, and like Sam connected with like Anatoly and the Solana team and you're like, oh my God, like this is the future of this, this is how we're going to build the future of France, right? Like we are, we've got like, all right, we've got the tech team and we've got the go to market folks. Like this is how we're going to do it. Yeah. So uh, a little, little backstory. I actually ended up leaving Multicoin like right as Sam and Solana started talking. Like I wasn't really even a part of those conversations. And I had three offers at the time. Two of them were from Solana and one from LivePeer. And I actually went to LivePeer for about Mm -hmm. a month and a half. And this was when the whole genesis of Serum and everything was happening. And Solana was getting like pretty exciting from that respect. Um, and I was at LivePeer because frankly, I was worried about flipping the bird to the Ethereum ecosystem and all the friends that I had made at the mm-hmm. time. Because up until then, nobody had been able to compete with Ethereum and it wasn't clear that anyone was going to be able to compete. So during that month and a half that I was at LivePeer, things with Sam and Serum really started to pick up. And luckily for me, Raj was in my DMs like every single day telling me that if I was still interested in coming over there, that I could that I could join the team. Um, so I actually wasn't a part of a lot of that. But like, as I was viewing it from the outside, it was very apparent that like there was some sort of special sauce here that like really was enticing me. And given that my main focus when I was on the investment team at Multicoin was in DeFi. It seemed perfectly suited for me to go and kind of like exacerbate that effort. So that's why I ended up joining uh, in, in the fall. Hmm. Anatoly, do you think that you guys suffered in the obvious, like I have a feeling your answer would be things, things are going to be fine. We've got a bunch of builders, but like in, in the short term, maybe could you say that you guys suffered because of reliance on FTX? And and, the, and I guess the reason I asked that is you said FTX had eight engineers. They put half their engineering team building on Solana I'm like thinking about this from the founder perspective of BlockWorks. Like if we like outsourced our sales function, for example, to someone else, and then like three years later, they 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 pulled it away and they started focusing on something else that wasn't BlockWorks. I'd be like, ah, shit, like we, we got to race to figure out how to build that competency internally. Do you, do you, do you have a feeling of that right now? Um, we had built that competency already naturally as we saw like Sam kind of shift his focus to away from building DeFi products to like, you know, going to DC or whatever, or like, you know, working on the, on the FTX brand. So that was like a shift that where we were just not involved in that. Cause like, it wasn't like anything we could help with or like related to, to, to DeFi at all. Um, so we, we figured out how to do all these things on our own. Like, I think he was pretty important for the first hackathon and then like, maybe as a somewhat like as a lure for the second one, the DeFi hackathon. But after that, all the hackathons we ran our own, on our own, all the hacker houses we ran on our own, the conferences we did ourselves, like we kind of figured out how to market and like go to market, I think pretty quickly mm-hmm. uh, on our own. Yeah. It's funny. I remember being at, um, what year was this? September. Oh yeah. No, oh, no, this was the last, this was, wow. This was last year, November, 2021 in Lisbon at the first Solana at, at Breakpoint. Uh, you were you, I'm assuming you were at the multi-coin event that night. Yeah. Um, there, yeah, there's the multi-coin event. And I remember there's all these like, I mean, I met all the Solana founders. They're like these 22 year old kids that dropped out of school. And I was like, what's the hardest thing about building on Solana? They're like, well, so they're like, Solana is going to be the number one L1 if, and only if Solana can maintain the net, if Solana can build things and like people can 
aggregate or like build around Solana and it's and and they get off their reliance of FTX. So it's interesting. Even these young 22 year olds who had never built companies that like they were seeing it back then, which is really interesting. Yeah, that band aid got ripped off really quickly. <laughs> it did. It did. Which which maybe leads me to my next question. When did you first start to see when did you first start to be like like not not obviously didn't know the extent of things but like did was there any point in time when you're like oh man like his texts are feeling really manic or like oh man he's like blowing off calls or like there's something here or, or no i was i was just really not paying that much attention i would say like really focused on like the next fire that we have like i don't know if you're you weren't psychoanalyzing every text yeah. message from Sam. Yeah, <laughs> unless it's a fire, it doesn't get to your like level of attention, right? Yeah. Like, so, yeah, that it, it's really hard to tell, man. Like, I don't know. Ben, did you have any sense that things were funky over there? Not really. I mean, like after the beginning of the bull market, it like totally mentioned, it really just like our relationship with them started to dwindle. The people that we were interfacing with the most were like ecosystem level builders who may have been a part of FTX. We're talking about like Armani who like helped build Anchor and is now work, working on Backpack um, and people like that. So it wasn't a lot of interfacing with like the higher level FTX people like Sam or, or some of the others. Um, so like to be totally honest, like we were all completely blindsided by the mm -hmm. way that it all went down and like I mean, that's very self-evident by like Solana Labs and foundation employees who had assets on FTX and right. like, you know, company assets that were on FTX and that kind of stuff. So, um, I mean, there was really there was really no signal. And if there was, you know, we were totally blind to it. Yeah. And totally, what was the first like, holy shit moment when you realized that things were <laughs> maybe not going how like they were, they were supposed to be going? Like, I remember sitting I remember exactly where I was when. There's the tweet that Binance was acquiring FTX. Like what like what was that moment for you? What was that first moment? Yeah, this was um the the leak, I think, of the assets on CoinDesk yeah. was it CoinDesk was like pretty eye-opening. I was like, fuck, is this like how I but I thought it was contained to Alameda. Like, is Alameda gonna blow up? Like was my thought, like when I saw the leak of all the assets, because it seemed like they're that, I don't know how real that was. And then this was, I think, the last day of Breakpoint. We just had this amazing conference. There were like, I don't know, everything was packed. There were 1,600 devs at the Hacker House. The 3,600 total attendees. Yeah, it was twice as, almost twice as big as the last one. In this, in this bear market, right? Like we had, we doubled the attendees in the, in the conference. And like, I was like kind of paying attention to it, but not really, because I was, you know, we were really focused on what we we're doing. And then on the flight back, I was like, fuck, this <laughs> like, first tweet, like, uh, it's offer to buy FTT at 22. That's weird. Wait, <laughs> finance is now buying FTX. That's really weird. Yeah, that, that was a really, yeah, kind of gut churning flight. I'm still like, can't. Like, uh, really put the two things together. Like, the fact that we had like all this amazing growth and all these awesome builders and like showed up at, at the conference and like the vibes were just really great. Um, and like the shitstorm that followed, or like it seemed like two different worlds. Yeah. It's just hard to grapple with everything, honestly. It's just nuts that, that this all went down. So, um, I want to move this conversation towards talking about Solana now and, and, and the future. Is there anything else that you think is important in terms of just relationship with Sam relationship with FTX, anything that any points that you guys have seen laid out that you're like, that's blatantly wrong. Uh, so, I mean, there's been a lot of, I've been dealing with like the dependencies of like the fallout of FTX for the last two and a half weeks. And like one of the things that happened shortly thereafter that I wanted to clarify was a lot of APAC exchanges were disabling USDC, USDT rails on Solana, but keeping them open for other uh, chains. And as we've gotten into conversations with them to try and get them re-enabled, uh, the, we've realized that a lot of people have this misconception that SAM is to Solana as CZ is to Binance chain and like has control over some large set of the validators and can affect changes or like mint or burn USDC or USDT. So 
uh, I just wanted to like state for the record that Solana is a permissionless blockchain. Myself, Anatoly, Sam, nobody has ultimate control over anything that says on the blockchain and the validators have ultimate control over that in a decentralized fashion. Um, and S Sam is also, you know, like not uh, any part owner of Solana Labs or like anything like that. And that Solana, the blockchain was incepted in 2018 before Sam had even started. Hmm. Doesn't, I mean, one of the things that I saw people concerned about was that Sam, Sam or FTX or Alameda, I think it was Alameda is probably the right entity to use here, owns roughly 10%. I saw 13%. I saw 7%, roughly 10% of the, of the soul in circulation. I think that's true. And I think that's probably st still the case, honestly. So I'm curious just to get your take on that, Anatoly. Um, so in terms of what in particular, um, cause like the, 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 the data yeah. is public on the, on the fact sheet that the foundation had posted and you can also like query the blockchain and see the, the stake accounts that have been tagged to Alameda. So that is, that is a fact, but what in particular would, um, so that I has guess. no, that has no impact on security of the network. Like there, there's no way, even if Alameda controlled a hundred percent of the stake, they could not convince circle that you spent your USDC without your signature, right? You, you actually, your self-custody and Circle's node are independent of the quorum that controls, they can censor transactions, but they cannot modify the state in such a way to spend your dollars. So at the end of the day, that, that part is kind of irrelevant for the security of the chain. It has impact on liveness if they did a shitty job staking and then like those nodes were down, they yeah. would have temporary impact on liveness, but that's about it. At what, what number would be concerning if it was like Alameda owned 25%, that'd be concerning or they owned 51%. I, I, mean, like what's I mean, it's concerning that like this partner that we thought was going to like have their shoulder down building stuff on Solana had like, that was the reason why the, like those deals were made in the early days. We were like, guys, you gotta remember Solana in 2020 was I'm very much an underdog. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember. Trust me, I remember. Oh, yeah, <laughs> we were very much an underdog. Like everything was hard, and this was like a relationship that was cemented with like with that deal. And like they were, they had their shoulder down for a while, and now there's a whole bunch of tokens that are basically sitting around in bankruptcy court. Who knows what the hell is going to happen there? Yeah, but like that partner is no longer there. That part sucks, but the ecosystem's grown to the point where I think. Um, as you saw with like the open book for Casirum, uh, all the code that they built was open source. So kudos to them for doing that. And like, once you have products that are really good, that are open source, people will like reroute and, and fix and like move shit around, around like your failures, like very, very quickly. So that part I think is at least, uh, like working and working well. Let's, uh, imagine a scenario where you know, we're not necessarily in a bear market. Maybe FTX continues to operate as they were and they don't get this liquidity crunch and everything gets exposed. They had multiple investments in competing blockchains, as you said, Ben, right? Um, what is it? Aptos and, and a few others, I think. They're basically touching everything. So one, it sounds to me like, I mean, it. they're very uh, mercenary, like a lot of other folks, but they were just there to, you know, they built some infra to then take advantage of, um, you know, the opportunity and then pocket as much capital as possible. They were probably going to do that with other chains too, right? Now, what I want to get to the heart of is, was there anything in particular, you know, that you guys would say, hey, we had a more intimate relationship with Sam versus like Aptos, for instance, and maybe these things take time, but... You know, I'm just, I'm just trying to get to a better understanding of Sam could have probably in FTX, Alameda would have done this with other chains and they were probably setting it up to do it that way. Is that true? Or would you say that they were morally focused on like building infrastructure in Solana and then supporting it to then launch a bunch of tokens and profit? It's that? hard. It's hard to speculate on what they would have done with the other chains. Um, I think the reason why things transpired as they did with the Solana ecosystem is because both FTX and Solana were in similar states when uh, Anatoly and Sam got acquainted. Sam was building a small 
crypto exchange that was basically a nobody at the time. And Solana was this nobody uh, competing L1. And they found some product market fit in a central limit order book decks and like the relationship kind of blossomed from there. Um, so, uh, it's hard, hard to speculate on how that would have transpired with the other, the other chains that they invested in. How much are, um, how much are the protocols or like the, the DeFi apps built on top of Solana hurt by this? Like a lot of them, maybe if they're a D like a trading platform, like they probably got liquidity from, from Alameda. Like how, how much, how much are they? Obviously the Jupiter, they're hurt by Jupiter had their biggest volume day after the FTX collapsed <laughs> yeah it's and not so, to, that's not to gloss over like yeah. thing things are definitely like downtrodden right now and that's yeah. not to gloss over that but um uh yeah that the day when everything was happening some of the, the DeFi applications did some of their best numbers ever um so infrastructurally they're all fine um as i mentioned previously i, I touched base with a lot of them um there were only about three to four that were materially impacted by ftx like almost mm-hmm. like whole treasuries stuck on ftx and to those they've been properly connected with uh vcs and other funding mechanisms to make sure that they continue uh building or like acquisition opportunities um but outside of that uh luckily like a lot of them were like not as scathed as they could have been which is very fortunate yes. Ben, I know you've been putting out fires and you created this kind of repository website where to address and be very transparent with as things kind of evolved and escalated fairly quickly. On the BD side of things, um, what are you hearing from, you know, companies or projects, developers? Um, what are their main concerns? How how worried are they about this stuff? Um, and And what would you say to them? Yeah, so from what I've heard, a lot of the ones that we're building prior to all of this are pretty much continuing to build. There are some that need extra attention when you are talking to them, just because like a lot of them aren't on crypto Twitter. They like get their news from the headlines and they see these headlines that are skewed in like sensationalist ways that like they don't understand. So they see this headline and they're like, well, this thing said, you know, Solana's dead. And, you know, you got to explain why Solana's not dead. Um, so from 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 that perspective, it's a lot of just like one-on-one conversations with people who just need answers to questions. And that's kind of why the foundation put together that fact sheet to like post on the website. So we don't have to have a lot of these one-on-one conversations and you can get the information there um, c- concisely. Um, but it's a lot of just like, you know, getting the truth out there, frankly. Um, the truth is like this, these events of the last two or three weeks have sucked, but this is not going to kill Solana and Solana is much stronger than all of this. Hmm. The NFT folks like kind of didn't skip a beat for the most part. Like the next day there was some launch that hit record all time -time highs, which to me was like, really like, it seems like they're in a different world, which is really encouraging. Because uh, it means that crypto, like in general, has like legs that are outside of like the crypto Twitter, like in like financial side of like that that cycle. That there's like real product market fit for other use cases. So, and I think we're very blessed to have a very strong NFT community that is just really like kind of like not a, you know they're paying attention to this. Obviously, seen the news, but are not uh, like psychologically impacted and like, oh shit, everything's going to go to zero. And like, I'm, I'm done with NFTs on Solana, that they, they actually care about the product more than, than the, these new stories. That was a good overview of like the FTX, uh, Sam stuff. I, I want to, I mean, just like state, I want to get like a state of the state of the ecosystem basically from you, Anatoly and, and Ben as well, just for Solana. Like when I look at DeFi Llama, Obviously, Santi mentioned this TVL bad way to track this stuff, but like that's the metric I'm looking at. And I see ETH down 25%, Polygon down 20%, Avalanche down 40%. So like some some big numbers. These things are down a lot. Solana is down 71%, right? And is now the, the 10th biggest ecosystem. Um, I, I just love to get a state of the ecosystem from you, Anatoly. Yeah, a lot of, you know, like I, I don't know if FTX had as big of a had would have had as big of an impact if the mango hack didn't happen like right before it was like mm. a kind of two bad news really close hand in hand like i think really were really bad for solana DeFi. um but like the folks that are building are still there and like they're launching new products so i think mango's gonna launch before in like first week of december and 
they're a really strong team. So, you know, Serum got forked almost immediately because there was uh, this belief uh, that there's a risk to the upgrade authority um, for the for the Serum program. People weren't sure if the hacker or was moving money out of FTX had access to those keys. So within 24 hours, like there were enough external developers to really get Serum up and running. That that was like, I think, kind of like, <laughs> I was like holding my breath, like, fuck, everything is falling apart. But when I saw that like recover, that there were open source devs that just knew what to do and found their own market makers, like people you never heard of, like these are like small time hobbyist market makers that were just like, sure, I will go and support this like fork and like get it up and running. That really like kind of made me like, calm down and feel like, okay, there's, there's people that are doing stuff where we're not even involved. I wouldn't even know how to like get that to work. Cause I'm not a market maker. <laughs> like it, it just felt like, uh, that there's actual like people that care and, and like can, can get shit done. Um, that's the most important thing. I think like at the end of the day, like you need to launch products. Those products have to be good. And like, if their products were they're measured by TVL, right? You still have to launch awesome products and attract the TVL. I think that cycle is going to continue and, and going to keep happening on Solana. I'm mm -hmm. not as much worried about like raw dollar numbers of TVL as I am about like percentage of soul in DeFi. Um, and that's been definitely down because of both the Mango hack and the FTX thing. And I would like to see that recover and like start seeing products that are attracting like you know, new, new capital and like in, in new ways. Yeah. It reminds me of what you said about those market makers. There's this Chris Berniski tweet about Solana from a week or two ago. He's like, this is a big thread is good thread about Solana. We can link it in the show notes, but he said my view is like the fourth one. Now he's like my view, the Solana ecosystem emerges from this just as Ethereum emerged. I'm just reading this now uh, emerged from 2018, 2019 purged of opportunists with a hardened focus, tightly bonded community and unstoppable commitment to the cause more anti-fragile than when it entered the bear. It's like pretty. Yeah. Awesome, man. Chris is uh, like, yeah. What's what's, I mean, what's going on? Like why I feel like Chris is, I mean, uh, Chris is one of my favorite like thinkers and people in the space. Like why, why is he taking such an optimistic bent on Solana here? Like, are you guys in conversations with him? What's going on here? Um, there was a lot of like, surprisingly during this fall, like a lot of folks with dot ETH in their name that were just DMing me with support. It was really like uplifting to see. I think, um, I think at the end of the day, what we're building this idea of like, you know, globally synchronized, like, you know, information system for finance, it, it is fits with the decentralization ethos. We're not trying to replace Ethereum. We're not trying to build a product that is like, the ETH killer, right? Like it has its own place and its own niche. And I think a lot of people appreciate that. And that was really like surprising and awesome to see also, like, yeah. To, to just like elaborate on that. I think that something that we were blind to before all of this was how our perceived involvement with FTX was preventing people from getting into the ecosystem. And now that it's very public that they've been removed from the ecosystem, it's kind of de-risked it for a lot of people. And people actually see a lot of value here and they think it's more of an even playing field. So that's why we've been able to like open up to more of these people who you would never think would be a, a Solana ecosystem participant and are suddenly super interested in what's being built here in the long-term value. Hmm. I think, um, Ben, you and I have talked about this, but and Anatoly, I think in one episode as well, but do you think that Solana has been unfairly criticized time and time again um, as being, you know, maybe it's because of your success. Maybe it's now with FTX giving, you know, more reasons to, to people that have hated on you guys for a while. Um, how, how is that experience? You know, because I think from my vantage point, you guys have taken a beating and constantly take a beating from a very vocal minority in I, crypto and just in certain circles where I think it's you know how much do you pay attention to that have you like you know is that like just you just accept it, accepted the fact that it's going to always live there and you just build I, and ship and not listen to stuff I just see stuff? it as like a challenge I'm, I'm going to convert Evan Van Ness to be a Solana <laughs> Maxi by the next cycle <laughs> um, I think 
I honestly like think that a lot of the FUD and st- like not the FUD, but like a lot of the criticism coming from like intelligent folks in the ETH community is very much fair and I try to address it and like um in some ways like our engineering roadmap has like changed because of like what's happening in Ethereum. So that's been like a very natural, awesome part of like open source development, just being in the open and like showing your cards, having people shit on your design and then like <laughs> finding the kernel of truth, right? In in that criticism, like, okay, you're right about this and we can fix that. Like, I think that's a very awesome process that accelerates the entire space. Um, these are, This is like people arguing on the internet about tech, man. Like people were com- arguing about Linux file systems in the 90s. Like, what, what file system you picked in your kernel config was like a, a religious battle on the forum. <laughs> yeah. So I couldn't oh, well, take, it, take it like that. <laughs> I, I think, look, to address the question directly, to say it's been like psychologically easy to take this much criticism consistently for the last two and a half years has been tough, um, especially when you're ecosystem facing, like working with teams, because these also affect the participants in your ecosystem. So when there's bad news in the news, they're getting messages from their investors like, what the hell is going on with Solana? Why are you still building there? And they're coming to us for answers. And so making sure that like, you know, you're like, I, I constantly refer to myself as a glorified customer support agent. Like I'm constantly answering these questions for people and like giving them the reassurance that they need that like, you know, they're not, they're not on something that's like broken and like these are misconceptions and here's the right information. Um, but I think it's, I think it's like to, to Tully's point, like people arguing about like Linux kernel setups on forums. I think there's a component of this that makes it increasingly hard is because crypto is so Twitter based and it being so Twitter based means that like misconceptions, fake news and like virality plays a lot into like getting your information out there. So if you're not good at consistently combating that news from like, you know, a non Twitter account that can just make some shit up and then like suddenly that's the prevailing thought about like how Solana is, um, it's, it's pretty exhausting to like constantly have to like fight that battle. But I think that like, ultimately you don't make improvements on like world changing tech. Like we think we're going to build like a global state machine that's going to scale to billions of users. You don't make that kind of step function improvement without some trial and error and some punches in the face. So I think we're, we're all collectively here to, to take those. What do, what do you have? <laughs> Out here chewing glass, fellas. Um, what 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 do you guys uh what do you guys think are some of the fair criticisms? Like I think Santiago's right. You guys do get do take a lot of heat. What what do you think uh are some of the fair criticisms? Um, and then what are some of the things like guys, you you clearly just don't understand how some of this stuff is built. Like, yes, there was an outage, but like that'll get figured out. Like what what are, and then maybe there's some other things that you're like, ah shit, that is a big problem. We, we that is we really do have to figure that out. Yeah, um the the way our like fee mechanism worked prior to the outages was criticized fairly and was wrong. And it took like a, a real like, okay, I saw it fail live to start really thinking about and how to fix it. And that was like, I think a very fair criticism that a lot of folks early on layered, layered on Solana. And um, it took like a, a live failure for, for us to figure out why it actually failed. And if we didn't fail it, we we wouldn't have come up with like, I think an innovation, like I think localized fee markets are, are really cool and very different from how Solana, how Ethereum works in terms of like their fee mechanism and mempools. And I think what we built it is even better, but it took, it took some failures to get here. Um, I think the, like what influenced me was actually like one of the podcasts that I did with Donkrad on security. Um, in that discussion, like, he made a very strong point on how minimizing the the security assumptions is really important for the network to to get away from like majority like having a having reliance on the an anonymous majority um and like that's this is where like diet clients and that design came from where we want to provide the same like you know minority uh, if a small minority in the network is honest then you at least get a signal that the majority is corrupt and you can, you know, stop accepting the chain and then go to social consensus and yada, yada. Like stuff like this, I think is like very much awesome. Like it's just the best of open source development. I don't know if you ever worked at like a big company, like I spent a decade at Qualcomm. There was none of this like collaboration with competitors. Like you weren't yeah. writing code in the open. You couldn't like, you know, you have to ask your boss, can we use this open source library? This is like 
the most amazing engineering environment I think anyone could have is like working in crypto right now because not only is all your work you're doing open source, but you can literally like talk to your competitors and like if they shit on you with like a kernel of truth, you're like, holy shit, you're right. Let me go fix that. <laughs> and then we'll use the research that you've done to like fix fix these problems and improve my what I'm working on. I think that part has been awesome. Um, I think it's a pretty kind of dumb, unfair argument to just say that Solana is not decentralized. I think you're not really like looking under the hood and understanding like that the cost of the hardware is the cheapest possible cost that you can have to achieve what we're doing. You may not like want uh, a global price, synchronized price discovery engine. Like that may be not something that you care about. And that's great. Go use Ethereum. Like you can get settlement guarantees there, but a lot of people want that. And that's actually very important for finance. Like you look at the, the traditional trade fi stack, all of the money is not made in settlement. It's made in execution. <laughs> if, yeah. you, if you yeah. swapped out the settlement house with Ethereum, all that money is still going to be made by all these centralized entities that do the same shit that Robinhood pulled on, on like the GME mm-hmm. stock with like Citadel. Like all of that would still happen. And you need an open decentralized like execution engine. You need like tr- truly open price discovery where like any hobbyist can plug in you know, a hunk of organized sand and get in the same level playing field as jump. That needs to exist for, for you to actually disrupt that. Yeah. So a lot of people like get that, get what we're doing and, and like get the ethos and understand that that's very much decentralized and very much like an important thing to achieve. Yeah. What well, One of the big criticisms of Solana this year, I feel like was less about the decentralization, but sometimes more about the the outages. My, my understanding of the outages was everyone was basically wanting to hit the same state Flooding and spam. Yeah, so this was for, for a mint. This like, was a very much a fair criticism, and like we had to like I think get punched in the face to see how it was broken. So we guys came up with a good solution. It's uh, the the stake weighted uh, uh, quality of service. I think is the solution here. It's like three components. Three so like or quick too. We when we built this thing, we thought hey, totally. You want to just overview quick yeah, 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 and yeah. fee markets. Yeah, we, when we built Solana, like blockchain and Nasdaq Speed, I thought most of the transactions are going to be like Serum. And we were right about that. Literally 80% of the throughput was handling like market maker orders. And they're very small transactions. They take a very short amount of compute and touch a very small amount of space. And the way that our fee mechanism worked is we charge by signature because the signature verification part was the most expensive part of the whole thing. But... As the as developers started asking for more features and wanted to compose shit across lending protocols and all these other things, you started getting very complex transactions that were very expensive. And on top of that, when you start seeing like things like an NFT mint, even though those transactions were very uh, still very simple, very small, you had like we literally saw a hundred gigabit worth of traffic hit a single block producer. <laughs> that were all NFT mint transactions touching the same mint account. Uh, Bitfinex called it a DDoS when they published, oh, we had like a DDoS attack that was 100 gigabit. We were like, no, this is just, <laughs> this is just like people that want an NFT mint. We, we didn't realize that, be, I mean, like people were, were laying out that criticism correctly. And I was, I think, I don't know. I, I thought that one, we could process that much data that quickly. And two, that um, there was enough redundancy between leaders that at least some of the transactions would get through and it wouldn't be as bad as it was. And the other, me- the other mechanism would start kick in. Um, so that, that was totally wrong. So we had to throw that design out of the water and like figure out what is actually happening in the network and how can we solve it. And like we didn't want to solve it in the same way that Ethereum does because there's a very clear bug in how mempools work. When you have an NFT mint and a liquidation and an Oracle update at the same time, and there's congestion, everyone doesn't know what the price is to get into the block, but everyone is desperate to get into that block, no matter the cost. Because if you miss that Oracle update and your chain link, your Fox, if you miss the liquidation, you miss that huge opportunity. So everyone prices it at the maximum amount, bidding against all these other, like all these other use cases. And this is why you have like literally $4,000 fees on Ethereum, even though the number of transactions today right now on Ethereum is exactly the same as a year ago. 
<laughs> the the fees are, yeah. the fees are much much lower now because you don't have that like hotspot contention. This is like a classic database problem, and the only way to solve it is isolation. And you can do Cosmos style. You separate everything in, into different apps, and they're totally isolated from each other. Or you do like transaction isolation, which is you know old school database stuff. You make sure that transactions that touch the same that touch different parts of the state can be processed in parallel effectively with their own congestion control that's very localized to those. And unless we saw how we failed, I don't think we would have come to that design. And then we, we would just wouldn't even have like, you know, the per like we couldn't, I don't think even get like Serum to work if we just launched with a normal mempool. So that was learning. And like, I think important learning for us to have the, this was like these 100 gigabit floods of data is what caused the congestion and then ultimately caused the outages when that much data hit like a programming error where you weren't like freeing memory fast enough in some queue. And you just literally saw like RAM run out on, on these systems like within seconds. You had like a, a system that was running fine, all of a sudden it's trying to drop 100 gigabits worth of duplicate messages and it wasn't dropping fast enough and like, data was getting stale in sub queue and that queue would blow up to like, you know, 200 gigs worth of memory and that thing would crash. And then when you have a third of the network experience that, you get a Byzantine fault, right? Because more than a third failed and you got to take some intervention. Um, those bugs got fixed. And then the solution just like actually finally rolled out. There's no more UDP. The way that it works is that we can isolate each of these states as separate, uh, Think of them as separate mempools, separate fee markets. So when you look at a whole pile of transactions and you're packing blocks, you pick all the ones from the, the hottest, most important ones in parallel at the same time. So one way to think about it is you're running a bunch of different auctions and then you pick the top 10 auctions that are the, the highest grossing ones and you only fit those into the block. Oh, that's interesting. So now you basically added this like prioritization fee. So before like spam yeah. was really the only way to compete. And, yeah. and now you have a prioritization fee. And this comes down to, I think, huh. fundamentally what these networks. And wait, is that, is that the, I just want to make sure I understand that, Anatoly. Is that that's what you guys mean by the local fee market? The yeah. local fee market is basically allowing users to have their transaction included over others by adding the prioritization fee. And, that's Correct. And, and and there's no global fee system. So it's like different pieces Got of it. state will have separate fee markets. So like Got if it. you're Got doing an NFT mint, but somebody else over here is doing a DeFi thing, if the DeFi thing is not hotly contested state, they're going to have base level fee, but the NFT mint is going to have, Got you'll it. be able to compete so via it's just a new, it's a new way to It's a new way to compete for transaction inclusion. So, yeah. so we literally, we got a demonstration of this working during the FTX shit show there was a huge vo volume spikes and you saw that like, it wasn't perfect. You saw confirmation times increase for like transfers or Solana pings, but they were still landing despite all of these bots and liquidation bots slamming mm -hmm. the network and trying to, trying to spam and, and like take a hundred percent of the block. Um, mm -hmm. So like that thing that looks at a whole pile of transactions that are coming in, it's trying to identify, okay, I can only take, you know, let's say, the first 500 that are doing this like liquidation, I can pack those in into the block. And then I have to go find something that isn't a liquidation for that particular market. And that search takes time. And if it's if it can search fast enough and drop those irrelevant transactions fast enough, it can then pack in maybe an NFT mint or a transfer, right? Or like a Solana ping message. And the I faster think that think, think, is, Right, like, I think you're breaking Yano's brain over there. No, no, I actually, no, I actually really get it. No, that I, I didn't get it until just now. That's uh, okay. I, I read like quick. There's like quick, QoS, and the local fee markets. And I was like, all right, those three things together. I, I didn't get how these th three things come together until just now. So that that like process of like searching for the top grossing things for different state, right? That has to happen alongside. When you're the block producer, when you're receiving data, or you're when you're a random validator that's receiving data and then forwarding it, you have to run that same process because you don't want to allow an attacker that's just like paying one LAM port over everyone else to just spam and fill up all the queues, preventing the searcher from finding the other opportunities. So that that's it's like a knapsack problem. It's MP complete, but it, that doesn't mean anything. It means that it's just like a, a pain in the ass to optimize. 
at the at the risk of uh sounding well is q u i c do you guys pronounce that quick is that quick yeah quick at the, at the at the risk of sounding really really foolish here and making uh kind of embarrassing myself can i try to explain those three things yeah. to you guys and see if I, in in, in yeah. like layman's terms so okay so this local i guess the starting with quick quick basically like in a nutshell just gives validators more control over the traffic and it, Correct. and to help, to help prevent that. spams from like overwhelming validators is that yeah. right yeah so, and then in, so they can cap the amount of traffic they get to like one gigabit instead of like okay, okay. i'm going to process stuff as fast as i can get which hit 100 gigabit on some of these boxes the stake weighted qos makes it so that validators can basically just forward transactions to the leader based on stake stake weight is that right it means that like uh if you're unstaked or you have like a very small amount of stake or even a very large amount of stake you can't yeah. flood the leader and deny everyone else so if i have half of a wow. percent of a stake the 99.5 can't flood me out so, oh, so the leaders getting leader. spammed with with stuff like other validators can forward transaction right can this, forward, okay this guarantees see. that everyone has like some stake weighted amount of voice it's not Got a prioritization it. scheme but it prevents People from flooding the leader with like overwhelming amount of data from a single source. And then the local fee markets is what we just talked about, which that yeah. allows the user to have their transaction included over others by adding that prioritization fee. Correct. Right now, the only way to do it is with, is the only way to compete is really with spam. This adds yeah. the prior. Okay. Yeah. Huh. And you need these other two components because if you only just had like fee prioritization, then I will just like, flood the, the thing that's prioritizing fees and, and push everyone out. So the only thing that that searcher has access to are my transactions, right? So you need to like start shaping traffic and limiting the amount of spam that anyone can send to where it's more beneficial for them to increase the fee than to send two messages. Got it. Santi, do you want to pull me out of the, the weeds of this at all? or uh, <laughs> I, I, um... <laughs> We had to see like us fall. Like, that was we had no, that was interesting. Out. I didn't know. I didn't know. Yeah. That. That's, a, that's a, I now realize what just happened, which is you guys kind of fell on your face a couple of times and you figured out a technical solution here. Well, or at least you have a thesis of, that this will work. So We knew pretty quickly what we needed to fix. Uh, it's just release... Shipping uh, layer one code fucking sucks, man. It just yeah. takes a very long time to battle test to get go through audits, like and like get this stuff out. So the one that nine release was like the one that was really brittle, and you saw in April like just congestion was constantly happening and all this other shit. And as soon as we ship one that ten, like even though we had like a an outage later that was just a random stupid non determinism in the runtime. Like performance and congestion was just like improved by you know dramatically. Yeah, like I, confirmation actually, I do have one. up two seconds. Like everything was much much better, and the latest release is even better. I have I have one other question. Sorry, Santi. Um, I'm curious, just to Anatoly or or Ben, uh, to to get your guys' takes on just monolithic blockchains. Like, I'm just curious, how, how's your guys' mind? Like the the last several months, we've seen a. L2s have a ton of success, right? Like Arbitrum's had a lot of success. Uh, Optimism had a lot of success. The, uh, what's going on in the ZK space is super, super interesting. Um, I'm just curious, how, how has your guys' mindset changed on like roll-ups, either Optimistic or ZK, and, as well as maybe app chains too, compared to the monolithic blockchain thesis? So like I am this like kind of really focused on this idea of having a global information sink that this could be the place where state transitions move at the speed of light through fiber. That it has to be a layer one. There's no way to like split that up into a layer two. There's no way to like, if you, if this thing needs to exist and serves the world, like some creates value for the world, the way that we're implementing it, I think is the, is the only way to do it. Like you need a, a single layer that's BFT that's globally synchronized without sharding or any subcommittees. Now that on top of this thing, you could have like a, like a single sequencer layer two, which does derivatives and gives you that like high frequency trading sub one millisecond, like confirmation time for that tiny market. But I think having that thing synchronized with the Solana every hundred milliseconds is a really compelling product. Like you can't, that's better than what centralized exchanges offer. So there is like, I think reason for you to have smaller marketplaces that are much, much faster that's synchronized on top of this like single giant state machine. Um, 
the technologies that are people developing for layer twos all would work on Solana. They would totally work fine. They would even work better because you get to synchronize your state much, much faster. Right? Like I think all, all that stuff is awesome. Um, there's a couple teams that are thinking about it in those terms, like actually like, okay, building a HFT derivatives thing that's running on top of Solana and like it has very high frequency Oracle updates and all it needs is a stable coin, right? Like that's bridged into it and that's all it does. Th those kinds of products, I think, make a ton of sense. It would be super easy to build. Yeah. Is there anything that you guys learned from these L2s and from these rollups though? Like, like when I, Solana was kind of the first like optimized ETH, like prior to rollups, Solana was the optimized ETH. Um, like what's the new Solana look like? What's the new, I mean, we just went over a bunch of that stuff, but like when you think about the next couple of years, like what's the new Solana look like? Or I would maybe better put like, are there new learnings or things that you want to put in place? Like the move programming language or, 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 yeah. or anything like that? Yeah, there's a bunch of stuff. Like I think what I've borrowed, like what I see that's interesting that's happening in the industry is like clients or these providing users with minority, honest minority assumptions. I think that's really important. So because I don't think any network is going to have 8 billion nodes. Wait, I don't, I don't get that. Can you, can, can so you? So like Ethereum is not going to, Ethereum has like about 7,000 full nodes. You know, that's the security of the network. Bitcoin's at about 12,000. Solana's about 3,000. We're not going to see a world with 8 billion full nodes. Oh, oh yeah, I see. Right? So how does a user know that the net network isn't lying to them? Is the only way to do that is you either run a full node where you have full guarantees or you do a light client protocol. Like you sample the network and you get assumptions that if let's say 5% of the net network is honest, at least 5%, then I'm not screwed. But there's no way that the network is, is screwing mm -hmm. me. So these are the honest minority assumptions. I think those are really, really important for a mature layer one with a decent number of nodes like Solana to scale to a very large number of users. Because you still want to provide those users very high guarantees. Because once you have them, I think the chance of the majority going rogue become virtually zero. Like Because you can't pull off an attack because of these protocols. No one's even going to try. And I think that that's a really important thing to have uh, eventually. Hmm. Um, so that's very much like after I had that like debate with Donkrad and like I, his point like made a lot of sense to me. I started thinking about this, how we do this, how, how can we implement this in Solana? And like there's a design out and I'm hoping somebody picks it up and, and builds it out over, over the next year. So that that's like one thing. I think the... From Move, like this was actually also like I think a Move itself as a programming language, I think is a pretty good innovation. And it's um, really interesting that Berkeley Packet Filter, which is Solana's bytecode based on, that was one of the first proof carrying codes. The Linux kernel guys actually added a type system to BPF called BPF type format, BTF, uh, recently. And it does a lot of the things that the Move Verifier does. So it does checking of the types and making sure when you like join programs that they're joined correctly or, or the verifier fails. This is something that I want to add or like to the runtime so that we can have move compiled to Solana bytecode format that has native move verification and like interfaces with Rust. And Rust itself now has those verify that that level of like prov provability between two Rust programs. You know if you call like instead of trying to Compose these, compose these complicated cross-program invocations. Like if you have a program in Solana, you know what a CPI is. You have to like basically build a transaction between one program to another. You just, you can now just call a function like you do a library as a programmer. And that will make like the developer experience like I think a thousand times easier. So stuff yeah. like this, I think I see in the industry that I want Solana to adopt. And that's like one mm -hmm. of the challenges that I posted on Twitter. Like, hey, good, look, this, these are the things that we need to build. Uh, amongst along, a bunch of like performance optimizations. Along this thread, maybe just wrap it up, is you've seen now, I guess at the time you were building Solana, I think you had a pretty fresh take on it versus like copycats of Ethereum. But nonetheless, a lot of it was centered around how can we make something better functional. Um, now you've seen other chains launch. What have you learned from the new designs, if anything? Um, and what um, anything that you've implemented into the 
to roadmap and kind of the technical aspects of the chain? Um, so I think no one else is like really building for this like one single giant quorum. So a lot of the networking consensus stuff, we're, I think, still like the innovator there. That's been kind of like sad. No one wants to like go tell us how to how to build a better version of that because that would have been actually like I think awesome. Like a lot of our work that we do is in that deep networking code, and it's like if the if Solana had a hundred nodes, uh, I don't even think we would have had any like congestion problems because it's just much easier to set up firewalls and like deal with these like floods of traffic when you're dealing with like a hundred reliable operators <laughs> um, that you can like go call them up and tell, okay, guys, this is like, this seems like a bug in our code, but this is like how you set up these firewalls to deal with this like traffic. Just once you get to like a few thousand, it, it's intractable, right? Like there's no, there's no way to coordinate anything like that. So that part I think has been like sad, but like on the security side, Ethereum folks are awesome and like have been like super super forward thinking. And I think Move, I think, is a very forward thinking bike code that has a lot of awesome things for us that we can learn on. Um, ZK, ZK and like layer twos have not been like on my mind as much because they're still performance wise, they're just still not quite there yet. It still takes way too, too much time to prove a complex thing, like something like Serum like DYDX is a pretty good example. Um, the prover times for just trades were taking like two to th two hours around for like uh, 10,000 trades. And this is excluding, this is excluding like the actual orders, right? We're not even mm -hmm. talking about proving the orders landed on chain. This is post matching. You match just the trades and then you prove those out. Um, it's just not yet like. It's not ready for prime time. Yeah. There's just yeah. it could be ready for certain for certain use cases, but when that when those ten thousand trades take like, you know, well, that would take like four slots, which is like I don't know one point six seconds <laughs> to to verify in Solana. Like you're, it's just the why would you wait two hours versus like mm -hmm. having you know spend one point six seconds and do it directly on chain? Yeah, the we talked about on the prior episode with Nick Carter. Uh, this is something that I think about a lot is that the security um sustainability of a chain certainly bitcoin puts into question block rewards versus fees fees are very low block rewards are high but they're dwindling um how do you think about the economic sustainability of solana you know you have massive transaction volume uh but low fees um and so how do you maybe for like a layman person first start with how do you create a viable economic model uh, for security currently, is it subsidizing them long term? There's about like over a third, or like let's say twelve twelve hundred out of the out of the three thousand machines are, are are machines that are RPC boxes. They're serving some business that's running on chain that has a demand for state that doesn't care about the block rewards at all. They don't care about the fees that the network collects. They actually what they care about is the data. That's uh, represents ownership of JPEGs. <laughs> That's being propagated through this network. JPEGs or like maybe price fees or whatever. But that that twelve hundred boxes is bigger than most other layer ones, and they have no dependencies on the tokenomics of the network, and they provide the same amount of security because all you need is one of those machines to to be the honest node that says, "Hey, look." The majority did something faulted and here's the proof of that illegal state transition, right? Like that's all you need, like is really just any one of those. So I think security wise, what's really, really important for a layer one is that it's permissionless, that anyone can join and observe all the state and observe all the state transitions and that it has product market fit, that people actually have a need to join and preferably that need is actually external to the tokenomics, that they're running a business, they're doing stuff in the real world that depends on the state. And to them, the infra costs are, you know, like negligible and virtually nothing. Um, I think that would definitely cover and pay for security on the network, right? Like, I think to me that that's like a very simple and viable way. Um, 
I think in terms of like how networks accrue value, that's a very interesting question. And I've kind of like in my early podcast, we didn't even call it Mav at the time. I was just thinking like, this is blockchain and SXP and it's running a bunch of ex exchanges. Then a validator as a block producer is optimizing order flow. There's value to that. So there's value to, to the network just from that. Um, but I think it's more nuanced than that. I think functionally how the networks need to work is when I increase my fee, I need to, that fee increase in my transaction has to guarantee reliability. Like if I bump my fee, instead of sending two messages or like 10 or spamming the network, if all I need to do is just increase my, the price that I'm willing to pay by the smallest amount that I have a guarantee that I arrive first, if the technology can deliver that, then the network can start accruing map reward. And that, that's basically, I think, the, the really hard challenge. And that took, I think, some learning. This is not something that I just connected, I think, until like maybe the next, last six months. Hey, Ben, I want to throw it to you for a second. Um, obviously, this stuff isn't zero sum, but let's say, let's say the only two other chains in the world were the only two other ecosystems were Cosmos ecosystem and the Avalanche ecosystem. Who do you consider to be more of a um, like a threat to stealing market share from Solana? Who's a who's a closer competitor, or a competitor you wor worry about more? Maybe I don't know if I would consider them threats. I I mean I constantly talk about this all the time, and it's in my Twitter bio that like I, I love playing positive sum games, and we are definitely still in the phase of positive sum in crypto. There's a lot like right now, we're just like this collective hive mind that is taking different shots at scaling blockchains and applications of blockchains. And I think that all collectively, we're all moving in the same direction and we're feeding off of each other. Like Solana wouldn't be here without Ethereum and, you know, the, the EVM chains wouldn't be here without Ethereum. And like Cosmos, like kind of pioneered this app chain thesis, which is giving light to like other designs. So um, I, I, don't, I don't think of them as competitors, at least right now, maybe at some point in the future, it becomes zero sum. But for the time being, I, I really think that we're all collectively like feeding off of each other and it's a, mm -hmm. it's a positive sum environment. Can I push back actually for a second? Sure. I think I, yeah. everyone is a competitor. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, well, okay. So that was an, that was an, that was a play nice answer. Um, but, but I know what you're saying with like, we're, we're still so early, these ecosystems, it's zero sum. I, I it's not zero sum. It's positive. Like I, I see what you're saying. I think there's a clear zero sum game though, when it comes to, uh, amazing entrepreneurs building on in your ecosystem like stani choosing to build ave in eth instead of i mean solana didn't exist back then but like instead of on solana is bad for solana it is good for eth like that like uniswap existing in eth instead of on solana is good for eth and and i think the zero sum game that like you need to win as an as, as an l1 is getting the world class entrepreneurs to build on your on your l1 and i think that's where i'd push back um, that that feels like if I'm building an L1, that's the game I have to win. Cosmos, I would say, if yeah, if I, yeah, I like, I think Cosmos is like, I think, um, like very robust tools for spinning up your own private network. And there's a lot of things you can do yeah. with your own private network, like your own validator set. You kind of I mean, the the tendermint the tendermint infrastructure. I mean, I've just been a fan of since I was at my multi coin days. I mean, uh, like I, I think that they've done a fantastic job over there. I, honestly, I think like IBC has has not taken off in the way that they thought it was going to. But like, regardless of that, they have still been able to stimulate a lot of development on tendermint. And like, assuming that you know you figure out that that connective tissue at some point that works for everybody, then you know it's going to be a, a massively large ecosystem that can all feed off. And like, um, one of the reasons why I think like is really, really important to a layer one is to have its own unique runtime because like the runtime is your interface to developers. This is the sticky thing. Like developers will pick programming languages, virtual machines, operating systems for very peculiar, unique reasons. And when they do aggregate around a certain thing, that's your community. And like, I think running EVM uh is not going to give you that people that are deploying an EVM that are not on ethereum are ethereum developers that just happen to be like in another neighborhood or something <laughs> they're like mm -hmm. eat you're not like building your own like 
group of weirdos that are super into your particular programming language and how you design and like pick pick trade-offs. So I think this is the the strength of Cosmos is it gives people that like opportunity as an engineer to go deep into like the SDK and figure out what's the best way for me to like structure my code and like mm -hmm. optimize it. And that is a very satisfying like thing to do as an engineer. It's like my relationship with like my Linux box, right? It's, it's, it's like very important to me as, a, as an engineer. This is why I started building a Linux. You, you love Linux. I, I, I had that control, you, right? You, yeah. always, you always talk about Linux. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, to be fair though, like, uh, so we had the Cosmos guys on and I asked them the same question. It's like, they just don't have the BD muscle. Um, they don't. They don't have a Ben Sparango. And true, they, okay. and they don't. And IBC took a lot, like two years late. You know, late but what is BD? Well, that. Well, I guess you have. We have your BD guy here. So we're getting. We're getting pretty meta. Maybe he should yeah. ask. Maybe he <laughs> should ask. Like, no, I don't get to be the fair. point of BD. Why would I ever hire a BD person? Well, Ben's like, like, listen, <laughs> but you you have ben, I think ben successful. I mean, look at Polygon. Polygon has what I think a fan, did a fantastic hire for the guy from YouTube, and they've been crushing the BD game. You guys have to some extent also crushed the BD game until recently. But Ben, you know, why don't you tell well, I, us? I think I think, B, I think BD in crypto is a lot like decentralization. When people talk about decentralization, they talk about stake decentralization and no decentralization and yeah, like all of the decentralization of data centers or wherever you're running your nodes. And like, there's so many different composites of decentralization. Same mm -hmm. goes for BD. Like BD could include uh, brand marketing. BD could include talking to ecosystem projects. BD could include getting new developers into the ecosystem. BD could include web two companies or fortune 500 companies which has been closely associated with like what polygon has been doing with a lot of these these larger company things so inherently what we've taken from like a bd perspective is like grassroots developers getting new developers in the door net new people into crypto building specifically on the solana blockchain for the the use cases that solana was built for so building unique applications not copy paste ethereum protocols onto Solana because that's not inherently interesting. And then we give the ecosystem projects and the people building on Solana the tools to be like their own BD team and go out and advocate on their behalf. So like, for example, you bring Magic Eden into the ecosystem and suddenly Magic Eden's BD team is going out and bringing brands and other people to launch NFT projects mm -hmm. on Solana rather than the foundation going directly to these these companies and saying, hey, launch this NFT thing on our chain, we'll give you $10 million. And then, you know, we make a we make a big splash about it. Now that has its own merits. Like there is there is eventually like enough headlines where people see that and they're like, oh, all these other people are launching on this chain. Maybe we should do that too. And okay. it kind of like skips the it skips the diligence <laughs> point. Um, no, no, I'm I'm saying I'm saying the, I'm saying theoretically, theoretically, a lot of the a lot of people have mandates for like web three applications, like a, whether it's a Fortune 500 company or a web two company. And like rather than doing the work themselves, they just look at the headlines like they're like any other humans and they try and like skip over a lot of the like legwork. They're not going to like focus on like which which one of these chains is like the right scaling solution? A lot of these people just have a mandate and they need to launch something, so they go with yeah. what you know sounds. Control easiest. F fifteen key, fifteen uh, words in the in the Q one or ten k of blockchain, you know, and right. pick one. So there, so there is, so there. Just just to put a point on it, there's like merit to both, and that's why we're doing like a lot of different things. So we're doing a little bit of the first, like for example, like during Breakpoint, we launched with Asics. Uh, the, sh the shoe company, ASICS did a Solana Pay integration where they sold 3,000 units of these Solana shoes, made 600K in revenue with zero credit card fees, all in USDC, and then had an NFT associated with it that did 1,000 sold in secondary volume afterward. Mm -hmm. So like we are, we're pioneering. Is this the Steppen thing or Steppen? Yeah, they, the partnership that ASICS did with, with Steppen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so we're, we're trying things on both sides of the fence and seeing which ones work out. But ultimately mm -hmm. what we're doing from like a BD perspective is we want to drive more usage 
to the Solana blockchain. We want like people to use this because it's valuable to them. Like people use the right. internet because it gave them new use cases to like connect with people socially or do e-commerce. Mm-hmm. We want them to give we want to give them new use cases. We don't want to, them to launch an NFT project just because like they have a mandate to launch an NFT project and then you know nobody talks about it five years from now. Yeah. I do want to touch on related to this thread, you announced a partnership with Google on Breakpoint. Um, and this is a good transition, I think, into talking about the Solana phone. Um, hugely relevant now. Of course, there's Apple and its monopoly on the App Store. And, and maybe touch on, to close out the media discussion, what you're doing with Google, what that means, and then segue in, a segue into, thank you for showing it, the, the, the Solana phone. Um, the Google thing is like a very infra-oriented uh, project it's very much fits within their expertise at like google cloud um solana has a lot of data like it generates a a big pile of data querying it is a huge pain in the ass and BigQuery is like one of the best products for querying data sets so them supporting a very reliable data source that's very queryable through google is awesome i think that'll like unblock a bunch of developers people can then plug in and build products on top of it i think this is something that i think if blockchains succeed, you will have these big AWS, Google Cloud, et cetera, et cetera, will give you access to that data. It's permissionless data, right? They're going to have it. <laughs> so that, that I think is like where it makes sense for Google to compete in the ecosystem. Um, like, so I'm pretty excited about that part because I think that's a, like having robust view and like fast and like low latency like way to visualize that information and query it, I think is like one of the blockers for building rich applications. As the data sets get gets bigger, as like the composition between NFTs get more intricate and like all the stuff, we just need these tools to exist. Um, the phone itself is not a partnership with Google. It is running Android. All right, can we like, see it? Can you can you show it up to the screen? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, he's got cool. one that's I haven't, I haven't, I haven't opened mine yet. I was going to say, can the, you text or call flow. Ben right now or something? <laughs> oh, that's clean. See, yeah, it's got like a little S. This is the, the fingerprint scanner. You tap this. It's, is this like a, is this a white, how'd you do this? Is this a white labeled like yeah, own so in a box solution? This company, Awesome Privacy, that's oh, built O-S-O-M. by. Yeah, O-S-O-M. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's built by Jason Keats. He was a iPad architect, iPad Pro ar- architect. Mm. He was like one of the first employees at Essential Hmm. and started this phone company to go build like a privacy phone. And we got connected again, like through an investor, but we just kind of hit it off. And we want to build a a Web3 integration there that guarantees user security of their seed phrase Hmm. and allows like developers to one, give them access to a dApp store that doesn't have these insane fees. And like free access to Web3 features, right? Like you can do token gated features. You can actually buy and sell tokens directly without having to pay like an app store fee. I think that part is very simple to understand. I think the part that's, I think, very subtle is that by moving the seed phrase into the the secure enclave, developers don't have to worry about security. Like there's no way they can steal your seed phrase. There's no way they can like take your money and run. And that's very important when you're building next generation, rich media applications with NFTs, with games that are very complicated. That takes a lot of iteration and a lot of work to ship those. And you have to do that. Plus keep this part of code secure and never leak your seed phrase. It's a very, it just really slows down the development process by just really removing that um, obligation from the developers. I think the kind of stuff that wallets do can just, iterate and get much faster and better. And like the stuff that people want to do with NFTs and these like rich metaverse experience can actually happen here. So that that's like, I think a, a subtle long-term thing. New, um, new, new user behavior is the yeah. most exciting thing about all of this. I mean, it's the same as when the internet went mobile, we went from desktop internet to mobile internet and it gave rise to new user behavior and then thus new product that happened after that. So this yeah. is just the graduation away from desktop crypto to holding securely crypto on your phone, which gives rise to like new use cases. So the one that I've been talking about the most and that I'm most excited for that kind of like intertwines with DeFi 
is payment, like, like the cold start for crypto payments. Everyone knows that stable coins are like one of the killer use cases that exist for crypto right now. It's basically free rails on Solana to transfer money around. And But the problem is merchants don't accept crypto payments because none of the consumers have crypto on their phones or an easy way to pay with crypto. So suddenly you have a, a, a Saga phone where I'm, I feel comfortable holding two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000 on this phone and I show up to a, a, a merchant and suddenly the merchants realize that all of their consumers have crypto on their phones. So it makes sense for them to integrate an iPad with Solana Pay point of sale service mm -hmm. on there where they mm -hmm. can get zero fee payments. And then suddenly you have the consumers and the merchants all holding crypto and then they want access to other things. Obviously, some of them are going to offboard and like convert back into fiat for dollar denominated mm -hmm. costs. But at the same time, you give them access to applications like buying an NFT or doing some other sort of Web3 enabled mm -hmm. application natively, pretty seamlessly. Mm -hmm. like just signing transactions with your thumbprint dumb question what happens if you lose your phone you have a secret it's just recovery. like yeah you do but like for normal th this goes back to the heart of the problem right that you have today in most wallets yeah, which is people like, are not equipped to manage their seed phrase v2 you can do like an identity service that's got uh that can talk to the trust zone certificate that's inside the enclave and then do recovery through like an mpc that's like mm -hmm. a V2 Like problem. social recovery, some sort of RG yeah. type of flow. Yeah. Okay. Do you, do you guys think that the driver of this phone is um, people who love people who love crypto and they want to like use a more crypto native phone? Or is it something like goes kind of wrong in society? It's like the Bellagio take. Like Bellagio is like really long on a crypto phone actually. Like yeah, like the best advertisement ever for a crypto phone. But his reason is because – one day, like Apple will do, you know, now they, they search your phone for like images of child pornography. Next day, they search it for like images of like swear words. The next day, they search it for like anything related to crypto and you're not allowed to own crypto in the US. Like, and, and then that's the thesis for the phone. Like, what is there's, there's, there's two, there's two things. Right now, I think it's primarily like left curve early adopters who are crypto native that want this crypto phone to try it out. And we're going to get new user input from that. <laughs> Long term, I'm I'm a big subscriber to Balaji and the network state and like self-sovereign identity because over time, as our lives get more and more digital, it just inherently you lose more privacy. So we need to generate product that will preserve that privacy and preserve the autonomy of the individual long term. I do agree that eventually you move towards a 1984 uh, society yeah. and you need to make sure that you have opt out tools. Speaking of kind of adoption, how many users have put in an order for the phone what do these users look like so we have like six thousand pre-orders okay like a thousand of them just occurred like over a thousand of which occurred um over breakpoint mm -hmm. so our target is like somewhere between 25 to 50k units next year um okay so this time next year we'll have kind of 50 100 000 solana phones in circulation on the wild yeah and and it's also it's also important to I mean, know that that would be yeah. fucking awesome if we had a hundred thousand. I'd be, I'd be nice. like, I'd be jumping off this on this <laughs> chair, dude. Like, <laughs> but I remember. I mean, these things happen faster. And you, Anatoly, I listened to our podcast from a year ago when you came on with with Mike and me, and you're like, if we had, it was some really low number of Phantom downloads. You're like, if Phantom was downloaded, like I think it was like hundred. I'm making up numbers here, hundred thousand times, and really it's been downloaded like. 500,000. But you, the number you said was like, if it got downloaded 100,000 times, my year is a huge success. So we usually do undershoot these things. Yeah. In the What's the day. price point of this? This guy? A thousand bucks. A thousand bucks. So, you know, a little bit cheaper than, um, than an iPhone, yeah. certainly. And the a reason to buy it now is it's a crypto native experience. Is that right? Like yeah. That's the selling yeah. Point? People that are pre ordering it are like the, the early, super early adopters, right? Oh, like they're right. the, like the early tech Tesla you have to buyer. you have to pre-order with USDC too, so you need to be like crypto native in some capacity right, right. to get the early early on phone. Um, but the the point yeah. I wanted to make really quickly before we move on yeah. is the, uh, uh, the 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 interesting component that comes with the Saga phone is like the Solana mobile stack or SMS. Uh, so uh, like e even even if even if like we fail at at the phone here and the phone doesn't get a lot of pickup you have the Solana mobile stack that can be integrated into Android phones that obviously you don't have the secure enclave in the phone, but you have a more intuitive user experience that makes mobile crypto a lot easier, which will also like give rise to like these, these new user behaviors and more stuff that you can input into like new product design for crypto. Mm. Could someone in Ethereum do this? And if so, like why haven't they done this? 
They can like literally send us a pull request to add EVM, Ethereum support. I think Neon is working on it potentially. Mm -hmm. And we will figure out how to audit it and get it in there. Yeah. Like it, it's like if people want to add Ethereum support or Bitcoin support, like just send us pull requests. Yeah. Cool. cool. I think uh, to give you guys credit, you know, I think we appreciate we've been kind of bombarding you with tough questions in this episode, but I've always thought that this is the kind of thinking that is kind of far out there that I don't see in other teams. Um, uh, you know, and, and I think it's a big gamble, it's a big bet, but somehow like it's now become much, much more important. Uh, if you, everyone that's following Twitter and, and Musk, you know, and, and the whole situation with the app store is very frustrating. I invest in a lot of games. I see the frustration from the team side and I can appreciate how some teams might want to actually just move over to Solana because it's like, Hey, here's where we have the users and it's, you know, we don't have the gatekeeper, which is Apple, which is just it's really tough. Um, so the, that was the opportunity of what drove this. Like I, I looked at the numbers of like magic Eden and open sea users. It's not that many people. It's like 25 to 50,000 people that are actually doing anything with NFTs globally. If we have this device penetrated to like the most web three, like early adopters, that's a better distribution channel for devs than the big app stores. Yeah. Cause those are like, that's your target audience anyways, right? Like those are the people you want to reach. I was in New York and I saw the Solana store in, in Hudson Yards. Do you plan on uh, doing more of these experiential stores uh, across the world? Do you have others? I know you have hacker houses. So Solana Spaces or Solana Stores, I forget what the title of the entity is anyway, but uh, they actually announced it's a separate entity uh, under the umbrella of Labs, I believe, but it's they're launching like basically like Solana Stores DAO, where you can basically like apply for like grant funding to like kind of kickstart your store. So it's kind of like a decentralized movement for people to spin up their license, own Solana license stores. at the brand. So yeah, like exactly. Tried and true model. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're, just, we're just we're just going to be another Chick-fil-A. <laughs> yeah. That's not bad. Actually, it's harder to get a Chick Fil A franchise and get into Harvard. So you know, he's like, I could go spend a thousand bucks at the Solana store, but I'm going to the Harry Potter store. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were gonna say Chick Fil A, but <laughs> yeah. If you spend a thousand bucks at Chick Fil A, my friend, we have a lot more issues to talk about. <laughs> oh, hey, well, it's not all for me, but Jen, so this has been a good discussion. Um, really exciting. The phone. Um, maybe we'll have to have you guys uh, this time next year or before that to just track the progress. What is the I mean, parting thoughts, and then also where's like the best um, way for anyone that wants to learn about Solana, who's the best point of contact, and what is the best kind of opportunities to get involved maybe with your team, with other projects, sectors, just open-ended question for you guys. Uh, so we are imminently, we do one of these like quarterly, but we're imminently launching a virtual Solana hackathon. Um, there'll be a fresh set of new prizes and new, uh, okay. objectives to tackle. So if anyone from a developer focused side wants to participate, uh, keep a lookout on the main Solana Twitter for uh, announcements around that. I'm going to interrupt you, but can you tell us the number of hackathon entrance participants over the last like 12 months? Cause I think that's a pretty impressive stat when I saw it. Uh, it's, yeah. it's north of about 20 to 25,000, uh, total participants. And then oh, sub, over sub, like the last year or the over last the year? last, over the last year, we ran one quarterly. Uh, okay. the last one had like 15,000 registrations and, uh, over a thousand or 700 teams or a thousand teams. I forget. It was somewhere in the ballpark of 700 to a thousand submitted projects. And like uh, a bunch of them got funding. Like this is kind of like if you're an entrepreneur that's thinking like I'm gonna, this is gonna be like my Web three idea that gets funding. This is a really really easy way for you to get in front of like all the top VCs and like, like get your product you know to the to the MVP stage. Also, if you go to Solana.com slash events, uh, you'll see the full schedule for the in-person hacker houses throughout the year for the upcoming year. Those are great places globally around the world to come meet other people from the Solana ecosystem, investors, Solana team members, uh, if you want to interface with them. But otherwise, other than that, uh, the best place to like get information about Solana is the Solana main Twitter account, Solana podcast, follow Anatoly and get some, some big brain networking news. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Well, thanks, guys. Appreciate the time. Anatoly, appreciate it. It's great to have you back. And Ben, uh, yeah, great to have you on the show.